verses, I don't have to move quite so quickly to get up to all those pieces of equipment. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. Tonight, the Lord willing, we're looking at Acts chapter 14, and we'll be looking at verses 11 through 20. Embarrassment, creation, and getting stoned. Acts 14, 11 through 20. I'm going to begin reading at verse 1 and all the way down to verse 20 because this is a continuous narrative that's going on here and it gives us a, a little bit of background so that we'll know what's happening. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and so spake that a great multitude both of Jews and also of Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lacaonia, and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked, the same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lacaonia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter, and Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates, and would have done sacrifice with the people, which, when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness, in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people, that they had not done sacrifice unto them. And there came hither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing that he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for this beautiful portion of text that reminds us that you are indeed the sovereign God, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who has given life and breath to all that have it. And even with Paul being stoned here, you gave to him life and breath, and you continued the ministry that you had given to him because that was your will. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for the text tonight. We pray that you will give us deeper understanding of it and the correct application so that each one of us, as we go about this coming week, might see your hand at work in our lives and through us to share the gospel of Christ, even with people who do not want to hear it. Father, we pray for your blessings on your word tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall that last week we looked at healing a cripple on the run. In Iconium, Paul had begun at the synagogue, apparently was able to continue in the synagogue because of the number of converts who had followed him, and they began to fill the synagogue, and he did this for a long period of time. The text tells us that. But when he was forced out of the city, Paul and Barnabas apparently resorted to open-air preaching at Lystra. That's what we have in our text last week. And there's no mention of the synagogue at Lystra because Lystra didn't have a synagogue. There was only that pagan temple in the priests of Jupiter 
as we see in our text tonight. So Paul did not waste precious opportunities just because his original method was not available in that place. The method being he always went to the synagogue first if there was one. And the lesson that we learned was that we should not be so stuck on our methodology and form that we fail to fulfill the function of our calling to preach the gospel. The second lesson that we learned last week, a very obvious one, is you're not required to wait around until somebody beats you up or tries to lock you up in jail for your testimony for Christ. We find that Paul and Barnabas moved on when they found out that that was about to happen. Earlier in the book of Acts, we saw that the early Christians had some kind of a distant early warning system so that they were able to warn one another when trouble was coming their way. The third lesson that we learned last week is Satan will always try to organize the opposition, even if the parties normally hate each other. And we saw in the text last week that the Gentiles and the Jews, who normally were at odds with one another, actually got together because they were both opposed to the gospel of Christ. The next observation that we had last week was the structure of the book of Acts. In the first half of the book of Acts, we see Peter performing specific miracles. When we get to the latter half of the book of Acts, Peter has faded into the background. We don't find him appearing again, except at the Council of Jerusalem. And then we see the Apostle Paul performing the same kind of miracles that Peter had performed in the first half of the book of Acts, indicating for us that Paul had a co-equal authority with Peter, and also indicating the transitional nature of the book of Acts, because as we start out the book of Acts, we have what Jesus had said in the first chapter. He said, I'm going to send you to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And so we see the revival in Jerusalem in the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And we find that spreading out to Judea. And then we find Samaria with Philip and then the Ethiopian eunuch, of course, in Acts chapter 8. And then we find the Romans in Acts chapter 10 being brought into the body of Christ. And now we see the expansion to the uttermost parts of the earth. And Peter is prominent in the opening part of the book of Acts because he's the apostle to the Gentiles, excuse me, to the Jews. And Paul is prominent in the second half of the book of Acts because he is the apostle to the Gentiles. And in the second half of Acts, we're reaching out into the Gentile nations spread around the ancient world. And so it gives us a good insight into the book of Acts here. We find as we looked at the contrasts between Peter and his miracles and Paul and his miracles, uh, healing an impotent man, Peter and John had done that originally. In the second instance, it's Paul and Barnabas. In the first instance, Peter and John were going to the temple for prayer. In the second instance, Paul and Barnabas were doing open air street preaching. In the first instance, the cripple was a beggar who first spoke to Peter, begging for an alms. In the second instance, Peter was preaching to a crowd in a loud voice and happened to notice the cripple listening. In the first instance, back in Acts chapter 3, uh, there is no mention of faith in the beggar. In fact, it says that when Peter told him to pay attention, what he was hoping for was some money and nothing else. But when Paul sees the crippled man, he's not a beggar, and God gives Paul the insight to know that this man has faith to be healed. In the first instance, Peter preached an extended sermon after the healing. In the second instance, the healing is followed almost immediately by an assault on the Apostle Paul. In the first instance, the healed man holds on to Peter and John as they enter the temple. In the second instance, Paul definitely does not enter the pagan temple of Jupiter and makes no mention of the lame man holding on to Paul. In the first instance, Peter was on sacred Jewish ground. In the second instance, it appears that Paul and Barnabas were somewhere near the city gate, which is what we read tonight. In the first instance, Peter took the lame man by the hand and pulled him upright. In the second instance, Paul merely commanded the lame man to stand up. So Peter is doing a miracle. Paul is doing a miracle. Same type of miracle. Man who's crippled from his mother's womb. But the contexts are different because God is not obligated to do things exactly the same every time he does them, even though the results may be the same as they are in this case. In both instances, the healing was done in public. In both instances, the healing was of a person that was known to the bystanders, so there were no fake healings going on here. In both instances, it was a man that was healed. In both cases, it was a man who was lame from birth. In both cases, it was a man who had never walked. In both cases, there's no mention of praying for healing for either of the men. 
although healing by prayer is still available according to the will of God today, if the sickness is due to sin, and we read that in James chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. And so as we look at this text, we discover some very interesting things because a very important young man came to Christ as a result of the situation that happened where Paul got captured and stoned. And that young man we saw was Timothy. They were people who lived at the area of Derby and Lystra, and apparently his mother and grandmother came to faith in the Messiah through what happened there that day as Paul was preaching. And we looked at that in great detail last week, but we'll not do that tonight. And so we had asked the question, do you think that it was worth it? What Paul had to go through, was it worth it? And the answer, of course, is absolutely it was worth it. That territory is still known today as the land of the thousand and one churches. Many, many ruins of ancient churches have been found in that area. An incredible revival took place when the Apostle Paul preached. Was it worth it going there and getting persecuted and getting stoned and running from city to city? It was worth it. And also, that's where Timothy came to Christ. And two of the books of the New Testament, First and Second Timothy, are a result of Timothy coming to Christ. Books that many young pastors have had to rely on for years and years and years, for the last almost 2,000 years as we look back over church history because of Paul going to a place where they did not want to hear the gospel. So just be encouraged. Your testimony is always worth it. The trouble that you go to is always worth it. The suffering that you go to is always worth it because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. And that's what brings us to our text for tonight. Embarrassment, creation, and getting stoned in verses 11 through 20. And as we looked at that text, we read it just a moment ago, we learn a number of very important lessons. Number one, when you start with the wrong premises, it is certain that you will draw the wrong conclusions, even when you have evidence clearly before your eyes. Look at verse 11. It says, when the people saw what Paul had done, did they see it? Yes. Did they see that it was a man that they knew? Yes. Did they know that it was a genuine miracle? Yes. The problem was they hadn't started with the right premises and therefore there was no possible way for them to come to the right conclusions about what they had just seen. Some of you have no doubt been to a, quote, magic show where a sleight of hand artist got up at the front and did something like pulling a rabbit out of the hat or, you know, would uh, reach into the back of his hand and begin to pull out all kinds of silk scarves and many other types of things, make balls appear in his hands and uh, throw balls up in the air that suddenly disappeared and, you know, sleight of hand type of artistry. You can't always believe your eyes, but if you do believe your eyes, you may not come to the right conclusions as to what, in fact, you just saw. This is a real problem in the area of criminal law, for example, where multiple witnesses will testify as to what they saw. And sometimes their testimony is contradictory because they all see it from a different perspective. They all come with different premises to what is about to happen and what just happened. And they're taken by surprise and, as a result, come to some wrong conclusions. We have a group of people here who saw what Paul had done. They were paying attention to Paul. It wasn't something out of the corner of their eye. They were paying attention to Paul, and when he spoke with a loud voice to a specific man whom they knew to be a cripple, they all saw that man stand up. Did they put it together with what Paul had been preaching? No. Instead, they came to the conclusion that the pagan gods had suddenly appeared to them in the form of men. And so they began to praise the pagan gods rather than giving praise to Jesus Christ who had, through Paul, performed that miracle. If you start with the wrong premises, you will come to the wrong conclusions. And this is particularly dangerous in theology. It is particularly dangerous in the Christian life. If you do not base your theology on the word of God, 
And if you do not base the practice of the Christian life on the word of God, you will soon be led into false doctrine based on your experiences, based on what you can see and hear and feel in this temporal world, and you'll come to the wrong conclusions, and as a result will not give glory to God, you will end up giving glory somewhere that it does not belong. Lesson number one. When you start with the wrong premises, it is certain that you will draw the wrong conclusion, even when you have the evidence clearly before your eyes. That's why the Word of God tells us faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. It does not say faith comes by miracles and miracles by some unknown supernatural power. The key issue is the Word of God so that you can understand what you see with your eyes. When witnessing, as in law, you must first lay a foundation. And we've discussed that before. I talked to you about what it means to lay a foundation in law when you come to trial and when you're standing in front of the jury. You have to lay a foundation. <clears throat> and if you don't do it, people will come to the wrong conclusions. Verse 11, when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lachaonia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. That's lesson one. Lesson number two that we get out of the text tonight is with a pagan audience, the place to start is with creation. You see, the pagans can see creation all around them. However, they can't make sense of it without the biblical explanation. That's why Paul immediately, here in his sermon, as soon as they said this, and they started to try to gather together some sacrifices to sacrifice to Paul and Barnabas, that's why Paul immediately switches gears in his preaching to try to draw his audience back to the doctrine of creation. Verse 14, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God. Now, who is the living God? Which made heaven and earth and the sea and all the things that are therein. He goes back to something where he knows he has a touchstone with even the pagans. He doesn't have to lay that foundation when he's talking to Jews in the synagogue. They've already got the Old Testament. They've already got Genesis 1 through 3. They already know that. They've got it down pat. They learned it when they were little kids. But he's talking now to pagans, and they've reached the wrong conclusion. And so he goes back to the living God, that is the God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. That's the doctrine of creation. You see, the creation reveals the true creator God. And Paul ties creation directly to the presenting of the gospel in the book of Romans. A great doctrinal book. It's not something happening on the fly when he's out there, you know, trying to stop somebody from doing something out there. No, he ties it directly to the gospel in Romans chapter 1. And, you know, as he wrote Romans chapter 1, I can't prove this, but he may actually have had this incident at Lister and Derby in mind when he wrote to Rome. Listen to what he says in Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. He's talking about the gospel. Very clearly, that's the context. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Gospel applies both places. When he's talking to Jews, he went to the synagogue. When he's talking to the Gentiles, to the Greeks, he's often doing open-air preaching, such as on Mars Hill in Athens. Or here in Lystra and Derby, where he's standing outside the city gate, very close to the temple of Jupiter. For therein, that is the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now listen carefully, because what's he going to move into? He's going to move into creation. He's writing to Romans, he's writing to Gentiles, he's writing to people who do not have the background of the Old Testament law. For the wrath of God, verse 18, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That word hold means to suppress. It's a wrestling term for trying to crush somebody under. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him, now you can't see God, I can't see God, he's invisible. 
but something about his invisible attributes is revealed someplace. Listen to what Paul says. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, very, very interesting and unique word, only shows up a couple of times in the New Testament in two different forms, so that they are without excuse. Paul, writing to the Romans, tells them that as you look around at creation, some of the invisible attributes of God are clearly manifest by the created world order. His eternal power. As you look at creation, as you see the vast expanse of creation, as you see the um, unbelievable power that's out there, the suns, the stars, some of which are so large that they could take a hundred thousand of our suns and drop inside, our sun would rattle around with a hundred thousand others the same size. That's huge power. You look at the planet Jupiter, which was named after this pagan god, Jupiter, who's mentioned in our text. It's so big that if you were standing on the surface of Jupiter, you would be crushed flat into a puddle of mush because the gravity is so heavy. This incredible power of God is revealed in creation, and the pagans know it. Paul says so here. The second thing that it says that's revealed is his Godhead. There is something about the Trinity that is revealed in creation, and you can see it in many different areas of creation. For example, the way that water exists. It exists in three different ways. It can exist as a liquid, as a solid, ice, and as a gas, steam. You discover there are many things like that in creation which reveal something about who God is and his Godhead, in fact. They are clearly seen. They are understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. And what is the conclusion that Paul draws? Therefore, all of the pagans, he says, they are without excuse. They can't stand before God someday and say, hey, there was no way that we could have known you. We never did have a Bible in our own language. We never did have an evangelist come and preach in our village. We never did have anybody come to us and give us an altar call so that we would come down to the front and, and trust Christ and repent from our sins and be saved. He said, no, they are without excuse. They have enough light to condemn them, to point them to the fact that there is a God before whom they stand accountable. And that's why Paul here, dealing with these pagans, in a pagan context, without the foundation having been laid in the scriptures about creation, Paul moves to creation because these people are accountable to God based on what they can see in the created world order around them. Paul goes on in the rest of this passage to show how they have, the pagans have twisted the truth of creation and it has led to sexual immorality, to idolatry of animals, to ultimately homosexuality, and then he gives a huge list of sins in verses 28 through 31. When you reject creation as given in the word of God, it will end up changing your life for the worst. If you start with the biblical doctrine of creation and recognize all that God did in the creation week and how it has set the order for everything, it set the order for marriage, one man and one woman. It set the order for clothing, God clothed them. It set the order for family structure. It has set the order for everything that is basic to life. All back in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. If you reject that, you end up at a very, very bad conclusion. Creation is one of the primary means that God uses to hold pagans accountable even when they have not heard the gospel. And Paul is referencing something that David wrote centuries before in Psalm 19. 
The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. That is the voice of the heavens. It doesn't matter where you go on planet Earth. The heavens declare the glory of God. It doesn't matter where you go on planet Earth, but the speech of creation all around you is clearly heard no matter what your language is. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. And of course, you know the second half of Psalm 19, how David goes on to parallel the message of creation with the message of the word of God. In other words, my point is, creation from the biblical viewpoint is where you must start when dealing with people who do not have a biblical world view. That's why we hold a creation conference here each fall. It gives a little more ammunition so that you, in dealing with people around you, and I hope you do, have something whereby you can start building a foundation which is a touchstone that they already have because the scripture says they're without excuse because the creation reveals certain things about the character qualities of God. They do not have a biblical world view, but they do have creation. They're able to see creation. Creation has a special message about God and they're accountable for knowing that message. Now, you know, as we said a moment ago, Paul didn't have to lay a foundation when he went into the synagogue because they already had Genesis 1 through 3. They'd already accepted it as the foundation that explains sin and corruption in the world. If you talk to the average pagan on the street, he'll talk about making mistakes. He'll talk about making some bad choices that had bad results. But he doesn't want to talk about sin. You see, the origin of sin takes us back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3. The origin of accountability and guilt takes us back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3. The pagan, unless he has that as a foundation, as a biblical worldview, will not come to the conclusion that he needs Jesus as his Savior. Because if a man is not a sinner, he doesn't need a Savior. And if he doesn't need a Savior, Jesus Christ is irrelevant. Genesis 1, 2, and 3 lays the foundation that men are born dead in trespasses and sins because Adam sinned. Because Adam brought death and suffering into the world. Before that, there was no death and suffering. Evolutionists want to explain it away as just millions of years of things killing each other and eating each other. But the scripture clearly says, Wherefore, by one man centered, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And that's not some obscure passage in the, in the prophets of the Old Testament. That's Paul speaking in Romans chapter 1. By one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. Wherefore death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Excuse me, Romans chapter 5. Very important for us to understand the foundation and why creation is so important. You see, the Jews already had a foundation that let them understand the need for a blood sacrifice for sin. What a contrast with these pagans, for example, at the temple of Jupiter. You see, the pagans did have sacrifices. Uh, they're about to do sacrifices to Paul and Barnabas here. But pagan sacrifices were never for sin. You can study all you want about the Greek and Roman gods, and the sacrifices were not for sin. What the sacrifices were, it was to appease the gods. It was to bribe favors out of the gods. It was to manipulate the gods. Because the gods get hungry and they come floating around. And you can read some of the ancient texts. It doesn't matter what ancient culture you go to. I mean, I read Ugaritic texts when I lived in Israel. Stuff written in cuneiform. And it talked about how the, the sacrifices were being made. And the gods were all floating around, smelling the sm smell that was coming up from the sacrifice. Because, man, they were sure hungry. That is not the God of the Bible. The reason for the sacrifices in scripture is because of sin. The wages of sin is death. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That is, no sending away. That's what the word remission means. No sending away of our sins. 
Behold the Lamb of God. Christ is God's Lamb. His sacrifice. Behold the Lamb of God. John 1.29. That taketh away the sin of the world. What a different concept of sacrifices we find when we look at the biblical text as contrasted with these pagan sacrifices that these people there at Lystra and Derby are trying to offer to Paul and Barnabas. Their whole worldview is wrong because they'd started with the wrong premises and therefore they were bound to come to the wrong conclusions. Lesson number three. Expect people to act and react on their wrong premises immediately when they draw the wrong conclusions. That sometimes takes us by surprise, but that's what we see happening in the text tonight. Usually when people have the wrong premises and draw the wrong conclusions, especially when it's a wrong conclusion against the gospel, they will not sit around and think about it for long periods of time. Human nature is naturally irrational and emotional. That's further explained or enhanced by the blindness that Satan has built into their hearts. Paul explains that both those two truths in the epistle to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. That's what we see going on here. These people are what the scripture calls the natural man. They are people who are not saved. The natural man is the unsaved man. There are three types of people that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians chapters 1 and 2. He describes those who are called the spiritual man, that is people who are saved and who are walking by faith. He describes those who are called the carnal man, and those are people who are saved, but they're still living like they were unsaved. And he describes people who are called the natural man. Those are people who are unsaved and do not have a clue as to God's viewpoint on anything. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. He is incapable of knowing them because they are spiritually discerned and he is spiritually dead. He can't discern anything. Paul says the same type of thing over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, where he ties it into a, another supernatural blinding that goes on where Satan is desperately trying to keep the unsaved people from understanding the truth of the gospel. Listen to what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, and that's clearly what's going on here at Lystra and Derby. Paul writes, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, where is he going? Where does that statement take you back to? God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. What's he talking about? He's talking about Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was across the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved across the face of the waters, and God said, what's the first thing he said? Let there be light. And there was light, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Paul brings you back to creation again here. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts. God has to do a special work of grace in the dark and hardened and dead heart of man to bring it to life and light. That's what God did at creation. That's what God does at the new creation when he gives you the new birth and you trust in Christ and are saved. Has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Lesson number four. People almost always have some twisted truth mixed in with their conclusions 
So they, the conclusion seems to be perfectly rational to them. Have you ever noticed that when you talk to somebody, they always have some little smidgen of truth, some little smattering of truth that's been sprinkled in, which makes them think that what they've got is the whole truth and nothing but the truth. They lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lacaonia, this is back in verse 1, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. Do you see the sprinkling of truth in that? The little smattering of truth? You know, Satan's best lies are the lies that have the ring of truth about them. God did, in fact, come to earth as a man. Jesus Christ was and is the God-man. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 tells us that. For in him, that is in Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You can't cut that any other way. In Jesus Christ dwells not just part of God, it says dwells all the fullness, and here we have a different form, but the same word that we saw over in Romans, where Paul says, the invisible things of him, the creation of the world, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Now here we find that same word, a different form of it, but the same word, where he says, in him, that is in Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead, not some kind of a Greek mythological progression of aeons up there, not some kind of a Gnostic half man, half God, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's what the scripture teaches about Jesus Christ. Now, you can choose to reject it if you want, but that is what the scripture teaches. In him dwelleth all the fullness, the pleroma, all the fullness, not just part, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The undiminished deity and the full, true, sinless humanity of Christ are essential to the gospel of salvation. Read Romans chapter 1 verses 1 through 4. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4. It makes it clear who Jesus is and what he did. That he is both God and man, that he died in our place for our sins, was buried, and that he rose again. His person, who he is, both God and man. What he did, his work. He died for our sins, was buried, and he rose again from the dead. Those are the central elements of the gospel of Christ. Paul is communicating that. And he takes us back to creation to lay the foundation to do it. And throughout his epistles, he constantly, as does Peter, and we'll see that in a few moments, moves back to creation because that is the foundation for every other biblical doctrine. If the doctrine of creation is not true, you might as well hang up your hat and go home. Because the Creator God is portrayed in Scripture as being the second person of the Godhead, Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was... Can you quote it? <laughs> John chapter 1, it tells us who the Word is. It's Jesus Christ. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, verse 14. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Scripture is very clear that Jesus Christ is the creator as well as Jesus Christ is the redeemer. He's the one who became the God-man that he might come to earth and die on Calvary's cross and shed his blood without the shedding of blood. There is no remission, remember. That's why you have to understand the purpose of the sacrifices. That's why the sacrifices of the pagans were always wrong because they were not for sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. And that's why Jesus died. He died for your sins. He died for my sins. And without the forgiveness of sins, we have no hope. Do you understand why creation is so important? If man's not a sinner, then he doesn't need a savior. And if he doesn't need a savior, Jesus Christ and his work on Calvary's cross becomes irrelevant. 
lesson number five. People will always assume that the so-called gods that they have created are the correct gods when they see a supernatural manifestation of power. They think that the gods they have created are responsible for it. That's true even today. When the evolutionist sees something out there in space that shows what is incredible power, and we know as believers that it is supernatural power that has put it there, when they see it, what do they ascribe it to? They ascribe it to their gods, to the gods of time and chance and matter, to the gods of it simply happened, to any god but the living God who is the creator God. They will ascribe what they see to their pagan gods. Verse 12, they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. They had already decided what the different roles of their many different gods in their pantheon, what their jobs were, and so they figured, well, this guy's got to be this one, and this guy's got to be that one over there, and if there had been two or three more, they'd have probably assigned different god names to them too. Lesson number six. Pagan priests will always go along with what the people think so that they can keep control of those who are blinded by Satan. A pagan priest will always see his job as testing the wind and then pretending to point the way. You know, we see that kind of syncretism, and that's what this is called. We see that kind of syncretism, for example, when you go down to Mexico. I, I spent some time down in Mexico uh, not too long ago, you recall, and while we were there, there were several parades that went on where they would take the statue of the Virgin Mary out of the cathedral and parade her around the streets of the town. And I was in multiple different towns down in Mexico. And you know, one of those towns, they have what they call the Black Madonna. It is a stone idol that doesn't look anything like you and I would think the Virgin Mary looks like. But it's all dressed up in the typical Roman Catholic garb and with a crown on the head and all this kind of stuff. What it is, is a pagan idol from ancient civilizations that lived in Mexico. And the Catholic Church has simply said, well, this is the way the people want to go. They already worship this idol. Let's just give it a new name. Let's call this idol Mary. And we'll dress it up like Mary and we'll, you know, call her the Queen of Heaven and we'll carry her around in our parades. They've been doing this for a couple of hundred years with that particular idol. Dear people, in paganism, the priests will always take advantage of what the people already believe and work it into their own system for the purpose of being able to control the people. That's what we see going on here. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands under the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. Lesson number seven, our time is running quickly. Blind leaders leading blind people do not like to be embarrassed. And when it happens, they will react violently and encourage the people to react violently. And you know, the timing in this passage is incredible. Now, this is the sovereignty of God. We've already talked about how nothing happens by accident in the plan of God. There are only incidents, no accidents. Everything within the plan of God is precisely timed so that ultimately he will receive the greatest amount of glory. The intersection of people's lives takes place exactly when God determines that it will take place because he has a purpose in doing it so that we will give him the greatest amount of glory. And we've seen many, many, many illustrations of that as we've gone through the book of Acts. We'll not repeat them here. But this is incredible timing if you look at it. All this is going on. They've just managed to stop the people from doing sacrifice to them. And some people arrive in town. Verse 19. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium. Now remember, these are the people who have been tracking Paul and Barnabas. These are the people who are so angry about the revivals that Paul has been conducting with people coming to Christ that they're going to do everything in their power to try to stop it. And they figured out, okay, this must be the next place Paul went. When did they arrive? They didn't arrive a day earlier. They didn't arrive a day later. They arrived just as Paul has put an end to the sacrifice that is about to be done for him and Barnabas. Was that an accident? No. In the sovereign plan of God, even the so-called bad things that happen in our lives are for a purpose and for God's glory. We talked about part of that purpose last week. 
when we talked about the immense results of what happened in that region with thousands of people coming to Christ and hundreds and perhaps thousands of churches being formed and a young man coming to Christ by the name of Timothy. Would it not be rather startling to you to see someone stoned to death, dragged out of the city, and as you stand there watching and weeping over his dead body, he suddenly gets up and walks. He doesn't run away. He doesn't even go on to the next town. It says he went back into the city. Now you pause and think about that for a minute. If you knew what had just happened, suppose you're in Paris during the French Revolution, and they bring somebody up to the guillotine, and you're watching with the crowd, everybody's cheering, and the guillotine blade drops, and you see the head fall into the basket, and you see the blood spurting all over the place. And then they're taking the body and they're dragging it outside the city and dump it outside in the sewer someplace. You're standing there looking at it. This was one of your friends. And suddenly, head goes back to the body. Body stands up. Body says, hey, let's go back into the city. You think, hey, that's where you just got axed. Do you think that made an impression on the people in the city? Do you think it might have made an impression on the priest of Jupiter? Do you think it might have made an impression that would have shut the mouths of the people from Iconium? I suspect it did. We don't have time to talk about it tonight because our time's almost gone, but Paul makes mention of this in one of his epistles, and the Lord willing, we'll talk about that next week, where Paul talks about the experience that he says, I knew a man about 14 years ago, had, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, caught up to the third heaven. Oh, I'm not going to get there tonight. Come next week if you want to hear about that. What do you have going on here? You have something very incredible going on. Having stoned Paul, they drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Lesson number eight. Looking back at the verses that come between the calling Paul and Barnabas by pagan god names and the attempted sacrifice by the priests of Jupiter, we find the appropriate responses when people draw the wrong conclusions about the gospel message. This is something we need to, to learn. Now we looked at the first part of the passage, we looked at the last couple of verses, now let's go back and look at the middle section that we skipped over, verses 14 through 18. We find the appropriate response when people draw the wrong conclusions concerning the gospel that we preach. Verse 14. Which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that ye should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. There are two things that we find in this short portion of text. First of all, we find some practical actions to take when people draw the wrong conclusions. Secondly, we find the applicable doctrines listed for us in this passage. First, the practical actions and response. It says they tore their clothing. That was a visible sign of horror mourning and distress in the ancient world. We should be utterly distressed when people draw the wrong conclusions about what we've said to them, where they haven't understood it. Second, they physically tried to stop the blasphemous proceedings. They ran among the people and they were screaming. They were shouting, crying loudly, it says. Then they gave a quick summary of what I call the pertinent doctrines that applied to the situation. And I wish we had time to go over all these. I'm just going to list them for you. They talked about the sinful state of men. Sirs, we are men of like, like passions with you. They brought it to their attention. They gave a call for repentance. We preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God. It's always appropriate to preach repentance. 
Point people to the fact that they're sinners. Point people to the fact that God calls them to repentance. And then they covered three doctrines. The doctrine of creation, the doctrine of the long-suffering of God before judgment, and the doctrine of common grace. You see, the pagans had attributed what is called theologically common grace. They had attributed it to the pagan gods. That that's the reason they were getting their, their rain. That's the reason that they were getting their you know bountiful summer crops. That was the reason that they had the rivers flowing. No. That's the biblical doctrine of common grace. God has special grace that he extends to those whom he irresistibly draws to himself and calls to salvation. But he has common grace which he gives to all people in the world. And so Paul effectively points out to them that their gods are not the gods who have done for them what they thought their gods had done. It was the grace of the true and living God, the God of creation, who was giving them this common grace. We too should always be ready and quick with our actions and on-point doctrines when faced with wrong response to our message. Peter says that in 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Are you ready? There will be people who challenge you. There will be people who do not believe the word of God. There will be people who need to have an answer. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. You have to start with you and a right relationship with God. But then it says, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Oh, I wish we had time to parse that verse. There's a lot in that verse. But you are to give a reason. And it's concerning the reason you believe. Why do you have the hope that's in you? And the attitude you're to have when you do it with meekness and fear. Peter also goes back to the doctrine of creation when we suffer at the hands of pagans, just like Paul is suffering here in our text tonight. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, that's what's happening, to Paul in our text. Happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their party is evil spoken of. Uh, that's what's going on with those folks coming from Iconium. On their party is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or, interesting that this is placed in the same context as murderers, thieves or as a busybody in other men's matters. I suspect there are a few busybodies in this church. Just remember it's put in the same category as murderers, thieves, and evildoers. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Paul said he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ even though many tried to bring him to shame and tried to kill him and plotted to assassinate him on various occasions. Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come, the judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Verse 19. Peter does what Paul does. He ties it back into creation. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their soul to him in well-doing, listen to the last phrase, as unto a faithful creator. Do you understand how the doctrine of creation permeates so much of the New Testament? And how it is the basis for our response as believers when we suffer persecution at the hands of the pagans? Our final lesson, and we'll not have time to look at all these references, but 
The lesson is bitter people don't give up easily. Verse 19. There came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul drew him out of the city supposing that he had been dead. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3 that one of the key character qualities of the unsaved is bitterness. Verse 14, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. There's more to go. Bitterness often goes farther than the extremes of getting revenge. It goes farther than friendship goes. We'll look at Luke 11 next week. The removal from, of bitterness from your life is the responsibility of the Christian. That's Ephesians 4.31. We'll look at that, Lord willing, next week. Bitterness will not only defile you, but it will defile and destroy others too. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. And then that interesting passage where Paul talks about an experience that he had, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. But we're already five minutes over time. So let's go ahead and close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the truth of your word, for its power. How we thank you, Father, that you, in your gracious mercy, have provided for us a Savior who is also our Creator. And as we talked about this morning, how he is also the King of kings and Lord of lords, and yet he came humbly, riding an ass, the foal of an ass, as he entered the city of Jerusalem at that triumphal entry. But someday he will come on the magnificent war horse, the white stallion, leading the armies of heaven back to judge the earth. He is our Lord and Redeemer, Savior and Monarch Divine. How we look forward to following in his train. The noble train, both men and boys, the matron and the maid. Those who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, who paid the sacrifice for sin. Not a sacrifice to bribe, not a sacrifice to appease, but a sacrifice to pay a penalty for sin. Our sin. Father, I pray that if tonight there is anyone here who does not know Jesus Christ as his or her Savior, that he might understand the scripture that says Christ came into the world to save sinners. And Paul adds, of whom I am chief. Cause that person to now fall before your feet, confessing his sins, confessing her sins, and recognizing and crying for your mercy, given through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, and believing that Jesus died for his or her sins, and was buried, and bodily, literally rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and trusting in the Christ of scriptures, cause that person to be saved and to enter into the life of joy and gladness, the new creation that you make in our hearts when the light shines out of darkness, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Take your word, Father, let it not return void, but use it in the way that you please. Cause it to prosper in the thing where to you sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight.